Hello YouTube friends, welcome back to another video. In today's video, I'm going to show you how to use Cloud AI in active pieces. This is going to be a foundational tutorial that's going to help you in our future videos when using these AI tools in our workplace. Most of the topics I'm going to be covering today will also work with GPT models, especially the automation that we're going to be showing off today. We will also cover the ins and outs of how to use Cloud AI so you can have a basic understanding of how it works. Even if you're not entirely new to using AI altogether, this should be something for everyone in this video. I'm covering things such as the various model settings, such as building up your prompts. I'm going to go through the different models that Cloud AI offers to give you a little bit of distinction so you know which models to pick. I'm going to go through the various testing to make sure that Cloud AI's responses are much more predictable. With AI, you never know what you're going to get. So we're going to do a balanced act between providing a good context and making sure that we don't overspend on the tokens. One thing that I haven't covered in any of the videos is using AI tables automation and form feature. I'm also going to be covering both of those features and I'm going to show you how to use those, including some tips and tricks. And lastly, I'm going to go through a demo which will use Cloud AI in ActiveVis environment flow to cover a YouTube scenario to generate a title and description for a video so we can post that on YouTube. So please sit back and relax, enjoy the video. So if you're new here, my name is Dennis and I'm a principal software engineer. I make videos on coding, automation, and AI every week. If you haven't subscribed yet, then please click on the subscribe as I will have tons of videos coming up. And if this video provides some value to you, please click the like button. I really appreciate the support. And with that out of the way, let's get into the video. Let's do a quick walkthrough of what we're building today. I have an example YouTube video. I want to create a description and a title. The main workflow that we're going to be doing is we're going to copy the YouTube URL and then we're submitting it into a form that we generated using AI table. The entry point to this application would be the AI table side of things where we have a form which has a single field where we can post a URL for that video. Let's take a look at how this works. I went ahead and copy the URL to this video. I pasted it into this URL. Once it gets submitted, it's added to this videos to optimize data sheet, which will be the URLs we added. And once that's done, the active piece is gonna pick that up and it's gonna process it and it's gonna be sent to Cloud AI and it's gonna add the description, the video ID. I went ahead and added a second data sheet, which will hold the different titles that Cloud AI is gonna come up. So it's gonna add the video ID and the title to these fields and insert a record. So since I'm specifying multiple titles to be generated for each time I added a URL, it's going to generate multiple titles for me. It's going to have a, a single description and it's going to be the video ID. Once the active is run, flow has finished and added the description along with the video ID. We can quickly examine how it looks like. You can see this little bit of description where what the video is going to be based on this transcript. It also includes a key takeaway at the bottom. We can see like a social proof before teaching is the list of takeaways at the bottom of the description. And let's take, examine the, the list of titles. I added five different titles. We can have different options as far as what type of style or which one we think will be best suit for our video. It came up with five different titles. You have different options. This is gonna be where the title is gonna be stored. And that's what we're building in this demo. Let's take a look at uh, Cloud 2.1. This is an article that they released last November 21st, 2023. And it shows that their API for Cloud 2.1 is now available on their console. If you're not familiar with console, once you have access to their API, they allow you to get into this console workbench where they allow you to build up your prompt. You can have different settings such as being able to tweak your model settings and change it. With this tool, you can actually build up multiple projects and different prompts. You can work with them simultaneously if you want, and you can rename them as well. So this is what we're talking about. We're going back to this later and do a little bit of demonstration and dive deep into the console app. It says that they update the pricing to improve cost efficiency for their customers. And the biggest thing in this release is the 200K context window, which allows you to have a larger data set that you can provide to Cloud AI so that they can provide the best answer for your question. That's from 120,000 tokens from Cloud 2.0 to 2.1, which has a larger limit of 200K tokens, which is roughly 150,000 words according to this article. And 
500 pages if you're uploading um, PDF documents, you can also provide that much context and material. The users need now upload technical documentation like code bases, financial statements like S1s, or even literal works like the Iliad or the Odyssey. You can add a big data set to their um, API and be able to come up with some answers based on that context. That's the biggest selling point when using Cloud AI versus uh, ChatGPT. When you compare it to the OpenAI's model, you can see that the context window maximum is 128,000 tokens, which is for the even for the newer uh, GPT model that did provide GPT 4 0125-preview only has a context window of 128,000. One thing that they added here as well is the two times decreased hallucination rate. When Claude can come up with an answer to your question, instead of coming up with a false statement, it's going to say that it doesn't know the answer. They added a couple of SDKs to make your life easier as a developer so you can easily work with their API. I'm going to go to the pricing model real quick and do a quick comparison between Cloud AI and OpenAI. The pricing is pretty much standard across the board regardless of what model you use, uh, it, whether it's Cloud Instant, Cloud 2.0, and Cloud 2.1. The only thing that's different between the different models is the context window since models are trained differently. Um, they're also the cloud instant is has a low latency, high throughput use cases. You're doing something uh, with computation, for instance, and you want a high throughput, um, just fast output from cloud AI, cloud instant would be um, something to consider since the context window would be the same as to 2.0. But if you want something better as far as being able to do reasoning for more complex tasks, then either 2.1 or 2.0 or 2.1 would be a better fit for your scenario. If you need a larger context window where you can hold a larger dialogue and you can provide much more details, context into the conversation, then 2.1 is the better choice, even though they're saying that it has the same performance as 2.0. With all that said and done, let's do a comparison between the GPT model as well to give us an apples to apples comparison. All right, let's jump into the OpenAI's documentation as far as their different models. The latest models that I previously mentioned is uh, GPT-4 for OpenAI, uh, 0125-preview. And this is up to par with the one that Cloud 2.1 just released, but it only allows for 128,000 tokens. And they're also specifying the training data, which is up to December 2023. It says that Cloud was trained on data up to December 2023 and may know some events into early 2023. There's a little bit of outdated data when it comes to Cloud, according to their documentation as opposed to GPT models from OpenAI. Not everyone have an access to Cloud AI at this point, but they are slowly running out to the public as we speak. And a lot of people should have access to Cloud AI at this point and be able to work with their language models. If you don't have access to their uh, API just yet, you can go to this documentation from Anthropic website. And on the second link, you can see we can click on the accepting applications where you can click on it and it's going to lead you to this page where you can enter your email information and your name and you can sign up for the waiting list. And once you get in, they're sending you an email that will give you access to their API and where you can generate your API key and be able to work with their large language model. And once you have an API access, you'll be given an access to the console Anthropic Workbench, which allows you to create multiple prompts. The best way to work with Cloud AI and all these different models is to go to this workbench so you can tweak the prompts and tweak the different settings so that you get the best output before moving it into your application. The max token is how large of a data set you want the output to be. You don't want this some to be small where your outputs can be cut off. You want to be able to have this high enough for it's reasonable bound. The system prompt is similar to the user prompt, but in the system prompt is a way of differentiating and add a little bit more context into the conversation. In our case, I want it to be a YouTube uh, SEO expert. I'm saying that uh, Cloud AI is the YouTube SEO expert who understand how videos go viral 
And that's pretty much the context. I'm role playing. I'm dictating that, okay, Claudia, you're going to be this person. And then as far as the human, this is the actual prompt that I'm going to be instructing it to be so that it can provide the best answer for me. When I was looking at the documentation, they mentioned that the, the XML type of approach is an ideal way of building up your prompt. In between this text XML uh, tags, I can include additional information about what I'm trying to work with. In our context, where I'm adding the transcript from the YouTube video inside this text and then saying that here's a transcript contained within this tag and then write five titles that are catchy and engaging. Uh, the title will include some emoji to make the user wants to engage. And second, write a description that summarizes the text data into three to four paragraphs. This is my way of instructing and making sure that I'm clear on what my intent is and on what, what the output is. I want it to be it also include a list of takeaways in the end, which also includes an emoji instead of having a hyphen uh, as far as the list. And then I'm also specifically saying to not include the format tag. And then lastly, I wanted to output a JSON format exactly as what is contained in the format tags. I've defined in XML format tags, which is enclosed, has the, the JSON format body that I wanted to produce. When you're ready to and go execute this, you can run it by clicking on this button on the top right, which will execute the code and the result is going to come on the right side. Let's go and provide a little bit of example. So I went and got a sample video so that we're using for this example. I want to grab this transcript, I go down to the bottom and it says show transcript. And then you can see that it shows the transcript on the right side. I can go ahead and copy that and include that as part of my prompt. Since I specifically want the context to be included between the text tag, I'm going to paste all that information within the text and I can part this away. After a few seconds, it's going to start coming up with a response. Right on the top, it will tell you what it's trying to do. Here's five catchy and engaging titles and emojis and three paragraphs description or summarizing the text and a list of takeaways with emoji, which is exactly what I want. We came up with five different titles and then at the bottom, it has um, an actual description for the uh, YouTube video and still a bit of um, extra characters that included, but no worries, I'm going to be cleaning that up um, later on. But the, the, you see the problem is enclosed in a format tag, which I can't get rid of. So. So it's a matter of figuring it out and cleaning up all these things in your tool once we get it into our process. So, but this is a good starting point. I encourage you to start using this workbench or something similar where you can tweak the prompt before you integrate it into your app. You're not wasting time on having a wrong response from Cloud AI. Once you're happy with your your prompt and everything that you've set as far as the settings, you click on the get code on the top right. Currently, they only have Python and TypeScript SDKs available. They also have the AWS Bedrock variation for those languages. And you can copy this code. So it'll give you exactly what you need with the settings that you provided, including the temperature, the max tokens, and the system, and then the array of messages. We're going to go to this code in a little bit once we get to the active pieces part of this tutorial. Let's look at different makeups of different data tables and the forms that are created in a table. So you have a general understanding of what it looks like, starting with the videos to optimize. So this is the entry point where the form is submitted. If you notice that there's a grid view on the top and then there's a secondary form grid view uh, on the same data sheet. I'm going to talk about why I have two grid views. Let's quickly go through the different fields uh, for the uh, for the URL. I have a field type of URL. So this is where the uh, URL fields can be submitted when you submitted the form. And along with description, this is a long text. The video ID is a single line text. The reason why I added a second form view, which you can easily do by adding a view on the top. If I want to create a new form, for instance, I have added this form, which only contains one field and I want it to be using this data sheet. I can't really do that because by default, it's going to include the description and the video ID, which I don't want to do. 
So the best way to accomplish that and limit it to only have the form field as part of the form is to create a second view, which allows you to hide the fields that you don't want. I'm still using the same data across the same data sheet, but have different views for different use cases. If I want to view the data from this perspective and see a description and the video ID and URL, then this grid view is what I'm using. And as far as the form is concerned, this is what the, the form is interfacing with, which has a limited view because of the two hidden fields. But the way to set this up is when you add a new form, you should go back to the settings. You can actually, if you go on the top, you can see that it's pointing to form grid view. When you add, let's say we add a new form, we can specifically say which which view do we want it to to take a look at. If we choose the videos to optimize, which is the original view, it's automatically going to give us the URL description and video added. But since we have a different view based on the same data sheet that only contains the only contains since we already created the the we're already using the grid view for that form we can't really select it anymore but you can select this form grid view as to, as to get associated with this form that you can only see so the users can only see the url when submitting the form and nothing else and the way to customize this is if you go up to the top right by default you're gonna have all these different stuff on the screen you just want to get rid of the branding and the zero one and all the stuff that's on the screen on display you can click all that you can uncheck each of these individually and see which one fits your style if you want to include a logo you can do that as well you can further customize this if you want to show a cover you can do that as well as far as the second data sheet is concerned this is quite simple it only contains the video ids the single line text and then the second fear would be another single line text which is the title for the videos that we're creating and as far as the automation is concerned when we submit the form i also added an automation this is the first time i've introduced the automation in my youtube channel i want to kind of go through this real quick when you create an automation in a table which kicks off the process from the AI table side as opposed to running it from active pieces. We added a trigger and action type approach. At the current time of this video, you can only select from four triggers as an option. The first one is form is submitted, record matches conditions, record is created, and scheduled time arrives. Those are the four different options that you have. I chose to use form is submitted because I want to specifically say that I want this automation to happen when the form is submitted. Obviously, you can have it set to record is created, which can happen from different places. Since I want it to come from the form itself, what happens when the form is submitted is the secondary, the action is going to happen, which is at this time of recording, they only have three types of action that you can do. I selected the send web re request, which is sending a request to an endpoint that is pointing to a webhook in active pieces. With that, I'm also including the record the request method as a post and then a JSON body at the bottom. You can also change it to form data or raw if you want to. In my case, I want the body to be a JSON, which I have defined two properties. One is the URL. Uh, we can retrieve the URL for the YouTube video and do a get a transcription for it and the second is the record id so we can retrieve this record that we were working with when we submitted this url one thing i want to point out is when you're adding a url and record id so kind of give you a little bit of some tips when you're forming the json body obviously you're going to have the curly braces and then you're typing in the url as i have and then you have the, the column and then you're going to have the the, the double codes and then whatever value you provide right if you want to open up the and get the field that dynamically you can do a forward slash which will open up the window which then you can select the the field that you want the first variation that you can do is pick the url itself or you can actually click on that field and pick this convert to json string which we will include the field along with a double coded you don't need to include the double codes if i want to exclude the double codes i can click on the convert to json string as opposed to having to include the double codes uh, when i define the value for that property we can do the same thing for the record id i'm gonna uh, type in record id 
if I want to include record ID, for instance, I can go and scroll down till I see record ID and I can click on, on the field as opposed to uh, clicking on the insert. But let's go back and take a look at the differences. If I click away, I'm going to do a forward slash and click on the form. I can just insert it, which is different from inserting a JSON string. So you can see the difference. You have the JSON string on the end and just the value of the record ID. Just a little bit of difference between the two. In this case, you want to wrap the you know the prop the value in a double code. But if you want to simplify things, you can do remove all that and do a forward slash, and then we can click on the field that you want and then convert to JSON string will be inserted. So that's kind of a little bit of a tip when using the automation when you're constructing the dynamic uh, JSON body for your automation. Let's jump into the active pieces side of things. If you remember, I mentioned that we're using a webhook trigger that's going to be triggered from AI table. This is just the webhook that we're using. We're copying this and we're going to go back to AI table. We go back to the Grivian, look at the automation. And when the form is submitted, we can, we're going to be sending a request, post request to this address. This is the same URL that we have on the webhook side, which we're going to be passing in the URL and the record ID, just to kind of recap there. And when you do a test, you're going to be receiving the URL and record ID as a body uh, when this webhook gets triggered. The next thing that we're going to be adding is we're going to be adding a code piece which we're going to be passing in the URL from the body of the webhook. We're going to be passing the URL and then we're going to go and expand this one. The only dependency that I have on this code is this nice library from NPM, which is called YouTube-Transcript, which does all the transcription and grabbing transcription from a YouTube URL. The entry point to the application is the code and then it's receiving the inputs. I'm just structuring the inputs and going to grab the URL, which we provide as a parameter to this code. We're declaring a variable called transcript. We're doing an await on the YouTube transcript on this function called fetch transcript. We're passing in the URL that we received from the webhook. And I'm returning a JSON object, which contains the actual transcript. When you receive the transcript, it's an array of objects with a text property. I'm mapping to the text, extracting the text bits part of the array and then joining each individual text with a single space and that's gonna make up this transcript and then as far as the video id created a function which receives the function to get the youtube video id which accepts a url string and then i'm declaring a variable for url params which creates this utility object which is url search param which we can use to deconstruct the url and only get the query uh, query string part of the parameter. We're passing in the URL, we're constructing in URL, and we're passing in the search property for it. We're gonna grab the uh, the V part of uh, the URL segment, which is containing the video ID. If you go back to uh, YouTube, you can see the URL on the top, you can see that there's a V equals to in the, all these text and string, it's parsed out and it's, that's the video ID and it's going to exclude other stuff such as the timestamp which is part of the url that's kind of the makeup of the url and that's what we're trying to do we're going to grab the the view uh, query string of the url segment and then we're returning that pd id property as part of this json object that's the makeup for this code piece that we have and then once we go and test this it's going to give us an object which contains the video id which corresponds with the, the youtube id that we want and it's include a description, which is a long text, which will have the, all the information that we need to provide to Cloud AI as a context so it can create a description for us. We're locating the record from AI table. If you can remember, it's the video's uh, AI optimized table. When a URL is gets inserted, we're locating this record by record ID that we received from the trigger. We're passing in the record ID. That's what we're using to locate that record. We're passing in the record ID. We're selecting the action find records using this connection with a space and then using that video's optimized data sheet. And then we're passing in the record ID. So when we do that, we can locate that, that particular record that includes everything such as the, uh, the URL. In this case, we only want the URL and that also includes the record ID, for instance. But the main thing is we want to make sure that it exists and we get a total of one which we're doing a branch here. We're saying if the number is greater than zero, 
that means that the record exists and we can process that URL. I'm also grabbing the cloud uh, AI key that is stored in the storage, which we're passing in the second code that we have. We're passing in the cloud API key that we generated from their website. I'm naming that as API key. And the, the transcript that I generated from uh, step number two is going to be passing, calling it transcript. Let's expand this code so you can see a little bit more what we're working with. We're adding this untrophic uh, dash AI forward slash SDK uh, dependency. Uh, the way to do that is by clicking on this add NPM package on the top right, and then we can paste it and then and then click add. And that's going to add this entry with the current version. And going back to the code, the code that you see most of the part is coming from the console you can and paste it when we go back to intro fix um, console uh, workbench the same when you click on it to get code you can switch to the typescript and this is the same code that we'll be using just doing an import on the top of the code and declaring establishing a new untrophic instance and passing in the api key we're declaring a message that we're then using the message that create to pass in the different options for this such as the model, the max tokens, the temperature, the system, and the messages. The only thing that needs to be changed is the text in between the text which we're providing as part of the transcript input. There's the same code that I added, the same import statement on the top. I kind of moved things around. I did uh, define a new function called code cloud, which accepts the inputs. I'm doing a destructuring of the API key which I'm passing in the API key and the transcript that we're passing into this code as found in this inputs. We're establishing a new anthropic instance and which we'll be passing the API key. The same message that we, we've seen from the workbench from Anthropic. And the only thing that I've changed is I split up the long text of messages into two strings. And then I have added and concatenated the transcript as part of this context. This is going to be dynamic depending on the YouTube that you're trying to analyze and creating a description for. The message is going to be awaited. We're sending the message to the result of that. That includes a description. And then we're returning that back into the calling code, which can execute it and return back. Let's minimize this. And let's go back to, to retest this. When you do a retest, you're going to be seeing all kinds of information, such as what type of model was used, how much input tokens was provided. It's 11,784, which is quite a large contact since we're passing in the entire transcript. And then for the output tokens, we're only receiving 304, which is not that big since we're only getting the description and the, the summary and the list of titles. And if you expand on the content, this is the actual thing that we're interested at, which is the result of the Cloud AI call, it, which includes the, the different things such as the emoji and description. We can expand on this one and you can kind of inspect that it. it has like a bunch of different um, strings and characters that, that we're going to have to clean up in subsequent uh, code. But it has everything that we want. It has like a JSON uh, body and then we're going to parse it out. We're going to be adding a code to parse out the result from Cloud AI, which is then I'm going to be setting as an input as the Cloud AI output. And then I'm just grabbing the text from, from step six. When we go to this code, we can expand this one real quick so we can take a look at the code. We don't have any dependency. What we're doing is we're just calling a couple of functions that are defined below. The first function is to clean the output. We're removing any character that we don't want, such as backward slash n, which is prominent in the in few spots as part of the result. And then once we've cleaned out the output, we're assigning it to a clean output content variable. And then we're, we're calling this extract JSON, which we're then extracting the JSON bits of the result. But it's going to find the starting point for where the JSON object curly braces starts and look at the end of that JSON and we're just going to extract the piece and convert it to JSON. Uh, we're going to go parse out the JSON string, which is on line 14. Uh, once we get that JSON string, we can convert that into a JavaScript object by parsing it and then set to data and we're returning that JSON body 
as part of this when we called the extract JSON to the calling code. This is an actual JavaScript object with two properties. One is for the titles, which is an array of string, which is perfect. And then the description, which has a description of what the video is about. It's a nice formatted JavaScript object that we can use in the upcoming steps in our activities flow. And the next thing we're doing is we're updating that same record where we inserted the um, the URL. We're going to update these two fields, the description and the video ID. We're using the update record action and then we'll set the same thing using the same data sheet. And we're passing the same record ID that we received from the webhook. And this time we're not setting the URL. We're only setting the parsed object that we received from the title and description. We're adding from the previous step, from step seven, where we're using that object and include it as part of this description and video ID. Once it's been filled out, the next step is to go to the different titles. If you can remember the second array of titles that the Cloud AI generated, we're going to loop through that array, add a loop piece, which is pointing to that array of titles. And from there, when you do a test, you can see that the item is a single string and it has an index of one, which is included in each iteration of that array. For each pass, in that iteration, we're gonna create a new record in a in AI table, which is set for optimized video titles. If you can go back, this is where it's inserted, it's inserted to this video ID in the title. And then this is including the, the field that we received from the loop. If you go back, you can go, click on loop and then the item itself, which is like a, a single string. The video ID is from the second step, which we've extracted from the webhook from the body and then once we fire this up it's going to insert this and it's going to return what we've inserted what what type of fields and the message of success code 200 that wraps it up for this video if you have any specific topics that you'd like me to do a video on please write down on the comments please share comment and subscribe as always and i'll see you guys on the next video see ya bye